Proverbs chapter 2, we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 5 a little bit later. We're going to look at Proverbs chapter 7 uh, a little bit after that. A few weeks ago, we were in Romans chapter 1. And in Romans chapter 1, we began to look at God's assessment of our culture. We saw that ours is a culture that has first begun by suppressing the truth of God in unrighteousness. We saw that in rejecting or suppressing the truth of God in unrighteousness, our culture then has leaned upon its own wisdom. In its own wisdom, then, our culture has denied God. And God's assessment of our culture is that professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. We also learned that that type of spiritual rebellion that denies the existence of God denies his authority so that man can live autonomously. That type of spiritual rebellion generally leads also to sexual revolution. That is the testimony of Romans chapter 1. That's the testimony really just of our culture and of reality as we see it unfolding all around us. And so we saw that in Romans 1. Today what we're going to do is we're going to look at Proverbs because Proverbs kind of exists as the antithesis of Romans 1. Proverbs chapter 2, you could even say is like, or Proverbs is kind of like the antidote to Romans chapter 1. Whereas in Romans 1, we learned of a culture not seeking after God, rejecting divine wisdom, pursuing his own wisdom, and then leading to sexual revolt and sexual revolution. Proverbs indicates that wisdom is found in those who seek God and fear God, submitting to him, and then leading to lives of purity. And so I think this will be really helpful to us, and you might think about it as uh, how to live in a Romans 1 world. Uh, The emphasis here, I have to say from the get-go, you're going to see language of my son. This is the the, the culture here is, or I'm sorry, the um, context here is that of a father giving wisdom and advice to his son. Please understand that this applies to everybody. Please understand also that although I'm going to be focusing on young men, Uh, this applies to women as well. We're going to be dealing with the idea of sexual purity and sexual sin. And we understand that in our culture, not only is sexual temptation out there for young men, but it also exists for women as well. And so let me just say that from the get-go, understanding that the language going forward is going to be masculine in nature, okay? Uh, But we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. It says, My son... If you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, and I'll just stop there and notice the words here, receive my words, treasure up my commandments, make your ear attentive, incline your heart, call out for insight, raise your voice for understanding, seek it like silver, search for it as for hidden treasures. The idea being, if you will have a longing for divine wisdom and insight, if you will have a passionate desire to learn discretion and understanding, there's a zeal here. And then in verse 5, he says, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And you think about young men in a culture which says you don't have any purpose, you kind of lose a sense of meaning, you lose a sense of calling. Uh, If you will set your mind to say, Lord, I want to know. What is my purpose? What is my meaning? What is my calling in life? If you will have a passionate desire to seek divine wisdom or to seek wisdom, it'll lead you to what? He says, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. It all leads to the fear of the Lord because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And this is where purpose is really found. There's an amazing thing happening in our culture right now. And we get, we thank the culture. Because in the insanity that's happening out there, uh, losing uh, uh, just uh, j- common sense, uh, losing any sense of wisdom whatsoever, uh, the foolishness that's happening out there is waking up 
It's waking up a generation of young people. And I would say especially a generation of young men who are saying there's got to be more. This doesn't make any sense. Uh, I, I, I look out there and I'm told that my masculinity is toxic. I'm told that I have no purpose and so on. There's got to be something more. And it's driving these young men then to search for something more. And what Proverbs is telling us is that when you have that search... It can lead to the fear of the Lord. And we see this happening all around us. We actually see it happening at Calvary. And he continues, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, and every good path. In other words, you'll come to understand everything that the culture has rejected or perverted. For wisdom will come into your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you, delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech, who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil, men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. And that's why I say that this is like the antithesis of Romans 1 because of the description of men there that wisdom guards us from sounds a lot like the description of the culture in Romans chapter 1. But notice in verse 16, remember we said in Romans 1 that spiritual rebellion often leads to sexual revolution. Sexual rebellion. And here in Proverbs chapter 2, we see the very same thing. It's the opposite. This is a seek wisdom. You'll find the fear of the Lord. And in the fear of the Lord, then you'll have discretion and so on. Protection guarded from the perverseness of the culture. And then verse 16, the emphasis naturally then is upon sexuality. So you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. And so we say... How do we then, as believers, live for the glory of God in the midst of a Romans 1 culture? Well, first of all, it starts with that zeal and that passion for wisdom and discretion and purpose and meaning, which leads to a fear of the Lord. Having found the fear of the Lord, then what are we told? Uh, This is going to guard you. This is going to protect you from the perverseness of the culture. And part of the process or part of the consequence of that then is to be delivered from sexual temptation, sexual perversion, as we see in verse 16. Very interesting. Verse 16 speaks of, and really this is just a personification of sexual temptation. A personification of sexual temptation. There's a forbidden woman mentioned here. This is that woman who is seeking sexual activity outside of the confines of the marriage covenant. We could say this is simply sexual temptation, which is drawing uh, individuals, and here in this context, especially young men, uh, into sexual promiscuity. The proper context for sex as designed for God is what? It was the context of marriage. God celebrates sex within marriage. Sex within marriage is joyful, it's delighting, it's intoxicating, he says, and a blessing. Proverbs 5.18 it says, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight, be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman? and embrace the bosom of an adulteress. And so he's using language here of a forbidden, strange, dangerous, and even deadly woman. What is he talking about? He's talking about sex outside of marriage, frankly. Why would you be intoxicated? Why would you be enraptured by a woman who's not your wife? He's saying this woman is forbidden. She's off limits. He's saying this, this, that's a strange thing to pursue uh, such a, a person. It's inappropriate. It's wrong. He's saying your sexual attention should be kept within the confines of marriage. He's saying the marriage covenant provides the boundaries for your sexual attention and sexual activity. Genesis chapter 2.24, uh, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That one flesh union is reserved for what? It's reserved for marriage. So... As those who desire the wisdom of God, those who are pursuing with zeal uh, divine wisdom, we recognize that God has a perfect design for sex. And that design for sex is within the confines of marriage and only within the confines of marriage. If you're here this morning and you're a Christian, but you are participating in premarital sex, that's sin. That's a violation of God's design. 
That's not at all how our culture sees sex, however. Sex within our culture is to be had whenever one chooses, with whomever one chooses. Such sexual liberation has become the symbol, right? It's become the symbol of freedom from God. See, uh, we are not a Christian people. We are a secular people. We will not be con- constrained to his morality or his standard of holiness. In the, the, I, I mean, this is it. I mean, we fly flags, right? I mean, so this is the, the symbol of our freedom from God is what? Our sexual liberation. That's where our culture is. And what I'm suggesting to you this morning is that we, and especially young men, as you think about being believers in the midst of a Romans 1 culture, there must be some safeguards that you have erected in your life so that the Romans 1 culture does not then creep into your life or even, we could say, into the church. So as we're going to see this morning, although our culture elevates sexual activity as genuine liberty, they've got it completely backwards. Sexual sin is not liberating. Sexual sin is actually enslaving. It's not the height of enlightenment to remove all sexual restrictions. In fact, uh, that's the basis of our most animalistic tendencies. And so, here we are. Knowing God's design for sexuality is good for mankind. He's the author of life. He's designed life for our good and for His glory. The way to blessedness in this life is to embrace God's design and to abide by it. Yet, we're in the midst of a culture which is increasingly... rebellious against God, leading men and women astray, embracing some other design for sexuality, which the Bible, Proverbs, would describe as foreign and forbidden, whether it be sex outside of marriage, sex outside of natural design, or simply being consumed with even a uh, digital device uh, where we simply ponder perverse sexuality in our minds. So as believers in a Romans 1 culture, We stand like the man in Proverbs 7, as we're going to see, who's looking out his window at a young man who's going to fall prey to falsehoods touted by the temptations of sexual sin. We're like that individual we're going to see in a moment here in Proverbs 7, watching it all unfold around us. Proverbs 7, verse 1. Again, very similar to where we started in Proverbs. My son... Keep my words, treasure up my commandments with you, keep my commandments and live, keep my teaching as the apple of your eye, bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. He's saying there's some vigilance necessary, right? You got to take some action here. You got to build up your defenses of what he's saying. Say to wisdom, you are my sister and call insight your intimate friend. For what purpose? Verse five, to keep you from the forbidden woman from the adulteress, from her smooth words. And there we learn that action is necessary. You want to be protected from the sexual promiscuity and sexual rebellion that's found in our Romans 1 culture. We got to take some action. Keep the words. Treasure up the commandments. Keep the commandments. Keep my teaching. Bind them to your fingers and so on. For, verse 6, at the window of my house, I have looked out through my lattice and I've seen among the simple, I perceived among the youths a young man lacking sense. Have you seen any young man, men like this? Uh, don't nod your head. There's young people here. Uh, verse 8, passing along the street near her corner, taking the road to her house in the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. By the way, don't scroll your phone after midnight. Okay, young men? There you go. There's a, there's a tip for you. In the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. And behold, the woman meets him dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. She's loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market, and at every corner she lies in wait. The ubiquity of sexual temptation, it's everywhere. She seizes him and kisses him. And with bold face, she says to him, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I paid my vows. So now I have come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly. I found you. I've spread my couch with coverings, colored linens from Egyptian linen. I perfume my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. For my husband's not at home. He's gone out on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him. At full moon, he will come home. 
With much seductive speech, she persuades him. And her smooth talk, with her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once, he follows her. As an ox goes to the slaughter, no resistance here. All at once, he follows her. As an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a stag is caught fast, till an arrow pierces its liver, as a bird rushes into the snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. And now, O sons, listen to me. Be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For many a victim has she laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is that way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. Now notice here in verse 7, again, we're dealing with a youth, young man. It says a simple young man, a simple young man who's lacking sense, naive, inexperienced. He's unmarried. He's unwise. And he's searching for some means of sexual satisfaction. And again, it's outside the boundaries of marriage, obviously. Because he's naive and he's foolish, he's a prime candidate the, uh, for such seduction. Prime candidate to give in to sexual sin. And so uh, the writer of Pro- Proverbs here is writing as if he's one witnessing this young man being led astray. And, and actually, we see three lengthy chapters. In chapter 2, chapter 5, chapter 7, we're not going to see them all. The writer knows that this young man's foolishness, coupled with ever-present temptation, is a recipe for disaster. And we say the same thing in our culture. Young men growing up, prone to sexual sin and sexual temptation, in the midst of a Romans 1 culture with sexual seduction and temptation absolutely everywhere out there, but also in here in the form of every digital device. And so herein lies our purpose this morning. We're going to look at the book of Proverbs and observe seven falsehoods offered by sexual sin. Seven falsehoods offered by sexual sin and how to answer those falsehoods. Our hope is to equip, yeah, young men, but all of us with divine wisdom to avoid sexual sin. So first of all, what we see from Proverbs 7 is that sexual sin offers a false intimacy. It offers a false intimacy. That is, somewhere along the line, the idea of sex and love have become conflated. We're going to make love, or you're going to have sex. These things somewhere become conflated. Look in verse 13. She seizes him and kisses him, and with bold face she says to him, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I have paid my vows. So now I have come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and I have found you. She's saying is, I have been searching for you as an individual. I've come to meet you, to seek you. I found you. Really? Because it seems like the proverb indicates that she's on every street corner and she's in the marketplace. She wasn't searching for him as an individual. She's searching for anybody uh, to ensnare. Yet it's personalized here, isn't it? Why is that? Because sexual sin offers a false intimacy. I think... Not only is the individual, this young man in Proverbs 7, after some sexual release, but he's bought into a lie. And that lie is that sexual sin offers genuine intimacy. And that's why many men, when they're lonely, when they feel alienated, when they feel like they don't have any close relationships, they're drawn to something like pornography. This is a false intimacy. I think this is supported by what the woman says again in verse 15, personalizing the greeting. In reality, she's just out there to ensnare anybody. Verse 10, again, she's dressed like a prostitute. She's wayward. She doesn't stay at home. She's in the street. She's in the market. She's on every corner. By the way, if you want a kind of a profile of a sexually immoral woman, it's right here. She's bold. She's loud. She's immodest. She's scheming. She's unfaithful. She's premeditating. She's flattering. She's hypocritical. It's all there. We can turn that around, obviously. I told you that this is going to be in the masculine form, but you can flip that all the way around as well and say that that also describes the promiscuous man. But here she's waiting for anyone that she can seduce. So why does she personalize her greeting? Because she's not just selling sex, she's selling a false sense of intimacy. She's preying upon his desire for companionship, really. This is essential when we talk about young men, because young men growing up, uh, maybe in those teenage years, feeling as if they're alone, feeling as if nobody quite understands me, nobody quite gets me, and so then there is a draw to a false sense of companionship and intimacy, which is readily found via the internet, for instance. Remember, 
that God's design for sex is one man. One, okay, wait, it's 2023, we've got to change this. This is one biological man and one biological woman committed to one another for life. That's God's design for the context of sex. That's genuine companionship. That is sex within marriage coupled with covenant. That's God's design, lifelong commitment. The sexual intimacy of marriage is, is or ought to be accompanied by emotional and relational intimacy, and God would not separate those two things. So there are men who, yes, treat their wives as if they are some anonymous stranger online, and that's wrong. And that's how pornography kills sex within marriage as well, because men then, having learned to separate the sexual act from relationship, bring that notion of sex into marriage and now treat their wives more like an object and sex more like just a physical release instead of the culmination of a relationship. Sex within marriage is to be the climax of the emotional and relational intimacy which is shared between a a husband and wife who are committed to one another for life. That type of intimacy cannot be had outside of marriage. The lie of sexual sin is just the opposite, that sex equals genuine intimacy. Verse 18, come let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. Really? My husband's out of town. Hey, random person that I've just met, let's go and take our fill of love. And there's the conflating of sex and love. She's trying to cover up the casualness of sex with this veneer of relationship. This is a sham. What this person's offering is not love. What he's receiving is not love. It's a sinful perversion of love. It's a shell of love. The foolishness of the young man is that he buys into this. He he buys into this lie and looks for something in sexual sin which it cannot give. And so the young man this morning who you're on the internet and you're looking at things you shouldn't be looking at and uh, you're lonely, you're looking for some sense of intimacy, you're looking for some sense of companionship, it never really fulfills, does it? It never really satisfies, does it? That's the nature of sin. This morning, if you're a man who finds himself drawn to lust and pornography, maybe you want to consider that the problem is not merely physical. How much of it is emotional? Have you failed to find relational intimacy? And so now you're finding in illegitimate places. Are you lacking a relationship with God of any emotional depth? Have you failed to connect with your wife in a meaningful way? Do you lack close friendships? In what ways have you accepted the falsehood that sexual sin provides that intimacy that you're lacking in so many other areas? So how do we answer the falsehood that sexual sin offers genuine intimacy? Well, we answer back by simply saying sexual sin is not genuine intimacy. Genuine intimacy comes only within the confines of marriage as God designed it. It's there where, he says, to become one flesh. It's only within this context that sex becomes meaningful and beautiful. Well, what if one is not married? Well, then you answer back and say that God has provided other avenues whereby we can experience close companionship and deep relationship. First and foremost, God would have such a relationship with that young man. Adoption. Come into relationship with me. Have a relationship, though you think nobody else understands you and you feel like you're alone. Uh, I know who you are. I know your greatest strengths. I know your greatest weaknesses. I know all of your struggles. And you can pour out your heart to me. There's an intimacy built into your relationship with God. So learn to pour your heart out to God in prayer. Learn to share your fears and anxieties and doubts and desires with your Lord. Develop that relationship with God where you can honestly confess all of your sin to Him without fear of rejection. And you can find a measure of emotional and relational fulfillment in that relationship with God, first and foremost. And really, that's why Proverbs is saying, young man, zeal, passion, search search for wisdom, and you'll arrive at the fear of God. Because at this stage of life for you, You may be young enough that marriage is not on the horizon. So what do you then do with all that sexual energy uh, up until that point of marriage? Well, what Proverbs is telling us is lead a life consumed with a passion for God. Lead a life consumed with a passion and a zeal for the wisdom of God. That's how you channel those energies. Do that now this way, uh, trusting his design for your future when it comes to marriage. So... Do you doubt that we should speak of a relationship with God in terms of intimacy? Well, look in verse 4 and 5. It says, Say to wisdom, you are my sister. 
Call Insight your intimate friend to keep you from the forbidden woman. And so reject the false intimacy and instead uh, channel those energies and the desires over here and call insight your intimate friend. That is that divine wisdom to keep you from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words. We see that connection also in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 where Paul is talking about sex and marriage. He says, I want you to be free from anxieties. And listen, he says, the unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. So there we see it again. We see singleness and the desire for relationship and intimacy channeled towards the things of the Lord. And so that single person then ought to have a passion and a zeal for the things of God. Now, the married person ought to as well, but you understand uh, the severity or potential severity of temptation for the single person. And so we see then a pattern. Those who are single should use their singleness for the pursuit of God. Uh, Single people can accomplish so much for the glory of God. Those who have the freedom to give themselves, to have a schedule that just serves the church and serves others, and is a praying person and a serving person, you have a freedom that others uh, could not possibly have uh, once they are committed to a marriage and have children. And so we see that emphasized throughout Scripture, whether it be Proverbs or whether it be 1 Corinthians 7. So don't waste your singleness. The unmarried man prior to marriage devoted to pleasing the Lord. Undivided attention, a wonderful stage of life. So number one, not doing very good on our timing here. Number one, sexual sin offers false intimacy. Number two, we'll just touch on this one. Sexual sin offers a false spirituality. Look at Proverbs 7, verse 14. Look at... Look at how this woman's trying to convince this man. I had to offer sacrifices, and today I have paid my vows. Really. She's using the language of the peace offering. She's saying, I've done my religious duties. I've taken care of my spiritual obligations. So now let's have our fill of love. She's trying to couch this whole thing in spiritual garb. She's trying to make it acceptable or palatable to a young man who ought to be living in the fear of God. It's okay. I'm a spiritual person too. Unfortunately, in our present day, there's also all sorts of sexual sin that has been whitewashed by hypocritical religion. It's absolutely no surprise that those who take part in sexual sin gravitate to religion. They need something to quiet their conscience. The sexually deviant cover their deviancy with a spiritual veneer in order to quell their conscience and quiet objections. It's okay, God approves. So we're going to put a, a rainbow flag outside our church. Well, God does not approve. This is incompatible with spirituality. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. And that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Colossians 3, chapter 5, chapter 3, verse 5 says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 Verse 9, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's harsh. But then that wonderful verse 11, and such were some of you. So all those who were just listed saying that you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven if you persist in those things, well, guess what? Uh, Any one of those can be converted by the grace of Jesus. And such were some of you. And so what do we learn? The Corinthian church was made up of the formerly sexually immoral, of former idolaters, of former adulterers, of former homosexuals, of former thieves, of those who were formerly greedy and drunk and so on. And so the church was comprised of uh, those who took part in those things prior to coming to Jesus. Such were some of you. But you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The point is, that belongs to the culture and it belongs to your old life. You don't carry it into the new. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says plainly, flee sexual immorality. It's not just people out there who wrap their sexual sin in spiritual garb. 
some Christians also. And you see this pattern that happens if you're ever counseling somebody who's prone to sexual sin. What happens is that individual goes through times of struggle, guilty conscience, repenting, and then going back to it. And there's this pattern. It happens over and over and over again. But then what happens is that person is so sick of the struggle that then they begin to think, well, maybe God is not actually against this at all because, I mean, it just seems to be part of who I am. I can't overcome it. So then they begin to justify their sin. They start to reconsider what Scripture actually teaches. They begin to try to find some other interpretations of those troubling passages which seem to call out their sin. Things like, well, in the same context, you see that we're told not to wear clothing of mixed fabrics. Some of you know what I'm talking about. They begin to rewrite Scripture, begin to reconceptualize the holiness of God in order to justify their own sin. It's this attempt to wrap up uh, sin in spiritual garb. All that is the tactics of Satan in the garden. I mean, coming to Adam and Eve, did God actually say... Right. If you want to justify uh, godless behavior, you simply question what Scripture uh, clearly says. It doesn't work that way. Again, Ephesians chapter 5, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not be named among you as is proper among saints. And and we see that repeatedly. We, We saw Thessalonians, Colossians, Corinthians, Ephesians. Why is sex mentioned so much and sexual immorality mentioned so much? Because each of those churches were Gentile churches in the midst of Roman one cultures, just like we are. The fact is sexual sin is an intruder into the life of a Christian. It has no place in the life of a Christian. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, when Paul addresses this man who's caught in adultery, Uh, really having a relationship with his stepmom, he says, is actually reported that there's sexual sin among you and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. And so we as a church then recognize that this type of behavior belongs to the culture. It belongs to a former life. Such sexual immorality is not to be named among believers and especially not in the church. And so we have to take a stand, don't we? Right? That's why we say, listen, if you're a young person here today and you claim to be a Christian and you're engaged in premarital sex, that's sin. This should not be named among us. And then the rest of the church also should not turn a blind eye. The rest of the church should not turn a blind eye as if such uh, sin, because it's so prevalent in the culture, uh, is not really a big deal within the church. We can't have that attitude. Right, And so we're quick to say, we love you, and we want God's best for you, and we want you to feel the embrace of the church. But listen, that sexual sin is not tolerable among believers, right? And uh, so we have to take that stand according to Scripture. So how do we answer back to the falsehood that sexual sin and spirituality are compatible? Well, I think we just explained that, didn't we? So moving on. Sexual sin offers false intimacy. Sexual sin offers a false spirituality. Next of all, sexual sin offers a false liberty, a false liberty. Look in verse 18 of Proverbs 7. Come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love, for my husband is not at home. He's gone on a long journey, and he took a bag of money with him at full moon. He will come home. Now, why does she say this? Why does she say, my husband's not at home? He's gone on a long journey. What she's saying is, don't worry, there will be no consequences. There will be no consequences. We have freedom. We can take our fill, no restraints, total indulgence, and we're not going to have any consequences whatsoever. That's the language of the sexual revolutionary. Freedom and liberty by breaking away from the restraints of traditional morality. The only thing controlling who can do what with whom is their arbitrary definition of love. And so what do we see? Love is love. Love is love. That's the only thing that defines uh, what is acceptable and unacceptable uh, sexuality. Scores of young people have bought into that lie. Liberty and freedom comes when we loose ourselves from the constraints which God has placed upon our sexuality. That's the lie. That's where true freedom lies. That's the idea. Of course, again, that type of thinking has its origins in the Garden of Eden. Oh, God did not actually say. In fact, if you were to eat of the fruit, that is, if you were to violate God's design, that's when you're going to find real freedom. Then you, your eyes will be opened. You'll not surely die. That's the lie. Genuine freedom comes through sin. The 
lie is that God is withholding good from you. That was the lie of Satan towards Eve. That's the lie today with the sexual revolution of our culture. Hey, young men, you know what? The constraints of religion are too much. In fact, uh, they're just trying to keep good from you. So come over here and indulge yourself. That's the idea. You're going to reap wonderful benefits uh, when you succumb or give in to your passions. It's the idea that God's rules are meant to hinder us. God's rules are meant to limit us. God's rule is, is meant really for no good reason. So eat, break free from those restraints, and so on. Not realizing that those constraints are for our good. God then, as the architect of life, shows us how we must live, and when we embrace His design for life, that leads to blessing. The fact is, God, again, the author of life, sexual morality is God's way of pointing us towards what is good and healthy, what's beautiful for us in honoring to Him. Those who indulge in sexual sin, do you notice, always speak in terms of freedom, freedom and liberty. They speak in terms of freedom and liberty while they themselves are actually slaves. 2 Peter chapter 2. Peter says, For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sexual passions of the flesh. Those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. It's like people in a prison cell yelling out to people who are out there walking, basking in the sunlight, enjoying freedom. Hey, come on in here and be free. (laughs) No, thank you. The person who indulges in sexual sin does so again in the name of freedom. They spurn God's rules and restrictions, will not be told by anyone what to do. They fail to realize that... Morality is for our good. Proverbs 5 pictures the person who spends their life indulging in sexual sin as ending their life with regrets. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 11. And at the end of your life, you groan when your flesh and body are consumed, and you say, how I hated discipline, and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I didn't seek for wisdom. I did not passionately pursue uh, instruction and so on. I didn't do that. I gave in to my passions. And now at the end of my life, here I am reaping all the natural consequences of my sexual promiscuity. As much as indulging in sexual sin appears liberating, we understand that it's actually enslaving and, frankly, can potentially be addicting. There's a suggested pattern of addiction that happens Young men, say women as well, in our culture, if you are one who's availing yourself to pornographic material, understand that this is enslaving. Understand that it does produce addiction. It follows a predictable pattern. There's that exposure to pornography that happens, however it happens. Uh, But then what happens with that continual exposure to pornography is a tolerance is built up, like other addictions. And that tolerance is built up so that the individual seeks new and and other forms of stimulation uh, due to that uh, tolerance level being increased. There's an exposure, there's tolerance, and then there's dependence that's developed. The person feels they must access such content just as a part of life in order to function, in, in, in order to cope. Exposure, tolerance, dependence, escalation. And then ultimately a loss of control. Uh, well, I can quit any time. This is the nature of addiction. I can quit any time I want to. But then you find, well, actually you can't. And then there's that cycle of negative consequences. Relationships are damaged. Productivity is harmed. You have the uh, uh, persistent feelings of guilt and shame, which then you deal with those feelings in some other unhealthy, uh, some other unhealthy coping mechanism. Exposure, tolerance, dependent, escalation, loss of control, negative consequences, and that continues. Pornography is addictive, therefore enslaving. One goes quickly from a misguided use of pornography to an enslaving captivity to pornography. So how do we answer the lie that sexual sin offers liberty? Well, we embrace a biblical understanding of liberty. Paul understood that genuine liberty, what genuine liberty was in 1 Corinthians 6. He says, all things are lawful to me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful to me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Now, in that context, he's talking about things that are actually lawful, 
But he says, uh, even some things that are lawful can be enslaving. We're talking about something that's clearly not lawful, but can be enslaving. So Paul was on such guard against anything that would rope him in to that type of enslavement that he was willing even to exercise moderation in those things that were permissible. So how else do we answer the lie that sexual sin offers liberty? Well, if you're a believer, you ought to answer back and say, oh, I'm already free. I am already free. There is no liberty in freeing me from Jesus. God does not enslave. God frees. Romans 6, but thanks be to God that you are, who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to that standard of teaching to which you have been committed. Now, he goes on to speak ironically and says, in having been set free from sin, you become slaves of righteousness. But John chapter 8 says, Jesus says that if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. The slaves of righteousness, again, being an ironic statement, contrasting it with being a slave to sin, saying now my entire life is devoted to the righteousness of God. But the fact is, I live that life in a freedom out from under the enslavement of sin. So uh, come and be free. Come and have liberty. And the answer is, I have liberty in Christ. I am totally free. And the freedom that you're peddling is actually enslaving. Sexual sin offers false intimacy. Sexual sin offers a false spirituality. Sexual sin offers a false liberty. Next of all, sexual sin offers a false ecstasy. As if sexual sin is satisfying. Verse 16 I've spread my couch with coverings, colored linens with, from Egyptian linen. I perfume my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. I mean, she's painting this picture the best way that she can. Come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. Beautiful home, expensive furniture, perfume, spices. This experience is going to be so satisfying, like nothing you've experienced before. In, in short, sexual sin is selling the lie of satisfaction. The lie of satisfaction. Everything you've ever wanted, all your fantasies will be fulfilled. And how many people, and we could say young men especially, going through life looking for some sense of satisfaction and then being sold that lie that you can find and be actually satisfied in some uh, uh, internal or some uh, important or all-consuming way simply through sexual sin. Promises satisfaction and fulfillment, but only brings what? Guilt and disappointment. Only brings guilt and disappointment. Sexual sin can never satisfy. We could say sin can never satisfy. But sexual sin can never satisfy. No matter how alluring it may seem, no matter how tempting it is, no matter what promises it makes, in the end, guilt, shame, spiritual crisis, relationships disintegrate. David experienced this in Psalm 51. David, after committing adultery with Bathsheba, have mercy on me, O God. He's completely unworthy. Lord, I just need your mercy. According to your steadfast love, on the basis of your covenant, answer my sin with your mercy. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression. He feels filthy. He feels dirty. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. I'm being haunted by the reality of my sin at all times. He says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. And so if you're here this morning and you say, you know what? It's really a victimless crime. Some anonymous person online. I'm lusting after this individual. So I'm not really sinning against anybody. I mean, the material is there. It's free. It's being offered to me. And maybe as we go into the future, an artificial intelligence is available. And uh, now that person's not even a real person. And you say, so it's a victimless crime. Well, what? Against you and you only have I sinned. This is a sin against God. This is a sin against God. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. David recognizing I'm prone to this. This is, this is human nature short of regeneration. I know that that fleshly nature is still there. I'm prone to such. I'm weak. So, Lord, I need your mercy. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Now, I know that there's divine wisdom that can transform me from the inside, and this is what he's longing for. So purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Here's this faith that God actually does offer a forgiveness that cleanses from the inside. 
Now, David is before his time here, and David is somewhat of a prophet as well, but David is speaking inspired words, really looking forward to a time when God will blot out the iniquities, cleansing the conscience of man. But there's a measure of that here, and that's what he's longing for. Lord, cleanse me from the inside, because I know that I was brought forth in iniquity. Now, as believers this morning, we understand that that type of forgiveness is available to each and every one of us at any moment. The Bible says in 1 John that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What David was longing for here, uh, each and every one of us has access to at any moment. So he's longing for this cleansing from the inside. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. He's saying, I've come to a point in my life, though David was a a man after God's own heart, okay, but he's come to a point in his life where the joy of his salvation has been zapped out of his life. So Lord, restore the joy. And you might be like that this morning. Sexual sin, sexual lust has stolen from you. You're a believer, but sexual sin or sexual lust has stolen from you the joy of your salvation crying out to God, Lord, restore it. Bring it back to me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. So change my spirit to pursue you. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Then, Lord, use me. Then use me to reach others. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. He's looking forward to that joy being restored. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. There's a reminder for us that when you find yourself overcome by sin of any sort, the answer is not legalism. The answer is not making an offering. The the answer is not self-flagellation. I'm going to beat myself up until I feel as if I've given enough to God so that now he'll forgive me. that's, That's a trap of legalism. And even David, even under the law, understood that that wasn't the right way to go about it. So you do not delight in sacrifice or I'd give it. You'll not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. That's the effects of sexual sin. A loss of joy, a feeling of alienation from God, a pervasive, persistent sense of dirtiness and a need to be cleansed. The right response, though, to that is what? Just a humble contriteness that comes to God and says, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need your mercy. Please forgive me. You're not going to feel worthy of that. But you, by faith, accept that through Jesus, there's a promise of forgiveness when we confess, right? That's essential. And so let's give a little bit of grace here as we close up and just say, if you are an individual this morning who has found yourself wrapped up and slave to sexual sin, you're in that cycle of guilt and shame. Your guilt and shame then leads you to further sin or or poor coping mechanisms. Please understand there's mercy. Even David under the old covenant could appeal to God's steadfast love, his covenant love, and seek his mercy. What you don't want to happen is for you to beat yourself up to the point then where you don't come to God for forgiveness. You say, but I don't feel as if I'm pure enough. I don't feel like I'm completely over that sin to come to God. That's the trap of legalism. Come to God, seek his mercy, and say, Lord, please forgive me. I am a sinner. I'm undeserving. But by faith, I know you promise that if I confess my sin, you're faithful and just to forgive me of my sin. Not because of my goodness, not because of the power of my repentance, but because of Jesus. And then by faith, accept that forgiveness and live as if you're, you are forgiven, right? Uh, don't beat yourself up uh, assuming that Jesus Christ is not sympathetic to your weaknesses. So, this woman paints a picture of paradise. This young man thinks that he's going into paradise, but according to verse 21, 23, he's actually going to be slaughtered. All at once he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces his liver and so on. This is always the case with sin. Sin never lives up to its promises. No matter how much we're convinced that sin will deliver, it doesn't. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 17, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant, but he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. And that's speaking of sexual sin. While sexual sin promises ecstasy, it brings turmoil. So how do we answer back 
to that lie that sexual sin offers ecstasy? Well, if you're married, you answer back that you have wonderful sexual freedom and liberty within your marriage. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18 says, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. We've already read this. It says, Be intoxicated in her love. Why should you be intoxicated with the love of another? So if you're married, you answer back and say, I have sexual fulfillment and sexual satisfaction within marriage with the wife that the Lord has provided for me. How else do we answer that falsehood that sexual sin is satisfying? We answer back that sin does not satisfy and that nothing on this earth compares to the satisfaction that awaits us when we live a life faithful to God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 that those who hunger and thirst after righteousness... And that reminds us of the beginning of Proverbs that we were looking at earlier, that hunger and thirst for divine wisdom. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they're blessed. Why? For they shall be satisfied. That's where real satisfaction comes from. As much as fallen man is attempting to produce a garden of earthly delights here, we understand that something far better awaits. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7 says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Is that recreation of Eden, where there there is eternal and full satisfaction. So the answer, only God brings ultimate satisfaction. Only a life lived according to His standard and His design brings satisfaction. So in conclusion... Maybe you're here this morning and you hear all this and say, well, this doesn't really apply to me because you have not or you do not plan to act upon sexual lust. You say, I have no intention of acting this out. I'm not going to be this young man going down on the street corner picking up a prostitute. But are you content entertaining lusts in your heart? Proverbs chapter 7, verse 25 says, Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 25 says, Do not desire her beauty in your heart. And then all of a sudden we realize that all of us, men and women alike this morning, are guilty of such lust. Jesus said very clearly, You've heard that it is said, You shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in your heart. And so we confess that all of us together have a heart problem, though we're regenerated. Uh, There is that temptation of our Romans 1 culture, that spiritual rebellion, which has produced sexual revolution. And although we look at the spiritual aspect of that and say, no, we believe in God and want to live for Him, the sexual aspect of that leaks into our lives, doesn't it? Especially through all those digital devices that we have. And so we recognize that living in a Romans 1 culture, that's a persistent temptation, but we as believers have a completely different sexual ethic. We live for the glory of God, and so we must take action to guard our own lives. And so, what do we do? Well, we started off by saying, seek, search, hunger, thirst for righteousness, search for the wisdom of God. Understand that that ultimately is fulfilled and only found in Jesus. If you're here this morning and you're prone to sexual sin, ask yourself, why is there an emptiness of satisfaction? Why is there a lack of intimacy in my life? And how can that first and foremost be fulfilled in my zeal and passion for Christ? Intimacy through relationship with God. Spirituality as defined by Scripture. Liberty as found in Christ. Ecstasy yet future as we look forward to full and final satisfaction. All of these things help us to answer back to sexual temptation. Now, just in conclusion, something very practical. If you're a man or a young man here who has found yourself enslaved to this type of sin, listen, I hope we have the type of culture at Calvary Baptist Church where you can talk to another man and say, this is my struggle. And I hope that we have the type of culture where if you are a man and somebody comes to you and shares that with you, you can receive that in a non-judgmental way and say, you know what? Just like Jesus Christ, our high priest, is sympathetic to our weaknesses, we ought to be sympathetic to the weaknesses of one another and come alongside and actually help instead of judging, whether that be through accountability, whether that simply be an ear to listen. But let's create that type of culture so that there are not men or young men or women who are suffering in secret, feeling the shame as if they could never talk about this type of sin 
right? We don't want that type of culture. We simply come together as if we're all upholding a certain standard uh, when we come into this place, but then go out there with all these secret struggles, right? That's not how the church ought to function. And so if you're a, somebody struggling with this, talk to somebody. If somebody talks to you about this, uh, provide a confidence and wise counsel and uh, an ear that can hear and be a spiritual encouragement, right? So let's develop that type of culture. All right, let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for your goodness. And Lord, I think that we, as much as we would love to think that within these walls there is a lack of sexual sin, whether it be premarital sin, premarital sex, fornication, uh, whether it be pornography, whether it just be internal lust, uh, as much as we'd like to think that that doesn't exist within these walls, I think that'd be naive. We are still prone to sin, and we are in the midst of a Romans 1 culture, which is producing sexual content, pushing sexual content, celebrating sexual content, and we're exposed to that all the time. So Lord, we recognize that in our midst at any given time, there are likely believers, men and women, who are struggling with such sexual sin. So help us as a church to uh, be a place where we can, using discretion and using wisdom, discuss these things when need be, to be a help to those who are struggling, uh, to provide uh, a path forward, a way to overcome, to help individuals be vigilant and on guard through accountability. Uh, so help us to have that open door to be non-judgmental, non-critical, but instead to be loving, recognizing that we're all made out of the same stuff, that we are to bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ, knowing that the burdens that we bear today for an individual, that individual may be the one bearing our burdens tomorrow. So help us to have that spirit of acceptance and love. Uh, so guard us against the sexual sin of our culture. Lord, we pray for any this morning who are involved in claim to be Christians who are involved in premarital sex as much as the culture doesn't see anything wrong with it. We pray that you convict the hearts of these individuals knowing that this is no place within the church, doesn't have a place within the Christian life. So uh, help them to uh, free themselves from this cultural understanding of sex where it's just become no big deal to them and help them to embrace your design and help them to do that really hard work of reversing a uh, relationship which has gone too far prior to marriage and give them grace, give them mercy, um, and help them even to reach out to others uh, to, to find counsel and to find help. And then, Lord, we pray for those who are married. We pray that you will help married couples to um, find intimacy and satisfaction within their uh, sexual union. And so help us to embrace your design for sex within marriage as well. Uh, thinking about Romans or 1 Corinthians 7. So uh, help us um, to respect and to love our spouses um, by uh, honoring one another sexually. Lord, we thank you for this, and uh, we just pray for your grace this morning. We thank you for Jesus who frees us from sin. We thank you for Jesus who gives us the strength uh, to continue to live uh, for his glory in the midst of a Romans 1 culture. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.